The Song of Summerlid Gilly Bride, father to the famed hero of the Hebrides, Summerlid, with the aid of Irish allies, landed in Argyle in an attempt to drive out the fearsome Norse. He collected the Irish clansmen of Cole, landed with full force of wood-wrapped wave riders, and boldly met the enemy for battle. Even with all the men Gillibraid could gather, they were still outnumbered by the Norsemen. Yet with axe, spear, sword and shield the gales attacked. The Norsemen moved as one and locked their linden shields into a grim wall ready for war. The gales roared in defiance and ran fast-footed for their enemy. They crashed like weaves against a thick stone wall. Shields slammed, spears poked back and forth, felling men to bleed out and be trampled under feet. The most seasoned warriors were at the front, men ready to face the frightening grim grip of slash and thrust. Great axes fell hard, splintering shields and giving gifts of gore. Archers rose above the shield walls and fired deadly fletch darts deep into the foe's nest killing and wounding enemy warriors who were felling too many friends. The clash of wild gales and raiding Norsemen was fierce, fast-hearted and filled full of woe. Hard men screamed, grabbing gashed faces and lost limbs. They vomited gulps of gushing blood and died in droves. Gillibraid, with crimson-spliced cheeks, hacked like a hero, leaving corpses with every cut. Brave beyond compare, he brought his battle crees to those foes like a raging lion feasting on the flavour of life's red liquid. He was a prodigy of death and destruction. His shield bore the brunt of enemy arrows, yet on he fought. But for every Norseman that fell, there were five to fill his place in that war wall. Though the gales fought like fiends, they could not bear the overly nourished numbers of the enemy. Gildebride's war host began to waver. His men fought against odds of two and three to one. They started falling fast, sucking their last lick of life, spliced red and in ruin. Then they broke, running in odd directions that led away from the Norse numbers. Some made it back to their boats, others were cut down by axemen and enemy archers. A few warriors fled for a nearby forest. They ran like wolves hunted by hounds, moving fast through the woods to hide deep in the dark and high on the hills. He and a few followers slew those Norsemen who chanced that deep, dark forest. When fully free of those foes, the gales scouted their way to safety. It was in Morven, high up in the mountains, where Gillibraid had to make a new home. Like so many Hayland men who had come before, and would follow after, he found the haven in the caves of Morven. For the people of Argyll and the Hebrides, this Norse victory led to sad misfortune and servitude. They laboured long under the yoke of their Norse lords, no longer living the life of freedom. Many of their young men and women were sold into slavery. Overtaxed and ever troubled by these invaders from the north, the people nearly gave in to the Norse lords, grim purpose. But some remembered that a saviour still lived, one reared in the old ways, one wild and untamed by time or tyranny, Summerlid, son of Gildibride the Brave. Now Summerlid had grown up in the wild woods of Morven and knew nothing of life outside that forest. It had been said that his mirror was the clear running waters of a rushing mountain river his drinking cup the sole of a well-worn shoe. His boldness came from hunting the fierce wild boar, and his great dexterity from dashing after the mighty deer. He was near a big man, but stout and strong as a bull steer. He favoured the forest life or any other, listening to the cry of the eagle and the call of the wolf. Moss and heather was a favourite pillow for his head. Summerlid was ever quick to learn and quicker to listen when wise counsel was given. Gillibride's boy grew into a well-tempered man who would rather spear a fish than a foe. He preferred peace and quiet to the rant and raving of wild drunken warriors. Ever liking to wander alone in the wood for days on end, 
Summerlid lived only to fish and hunt in his heel and home. The day would come, though, when destiny's fateful hand would tap at his happy heart and lead this humble man down a fiend-filled road. As the traditions of weave rep sky clean, the clan folk whom his ancestors had lang led collected in council and decided to offer Summerlid and his descendants chiefship o'er them. They sent out clansmen to find the forest dweller and make their bid to him for this high and proud position. It took many weeks of wandering the thick and wide forest of Morvern to find Summerlid. When they finally did, he was fishing thigh deep in a slow rolling river. Summerlid, never leaving the water or letting go of his fishing rod, listened to the skyman's lang counsel. His clansmen waited a weary while to hear a reply, for the only span of time a man of the forest knows is that of day and dark. Though Summerlid would be weel happy living out his life in Morvern Mountains, his good heart weighed heavy with the wrongs and worries of kith and kin. Summerlid pondered their plight while flicking out his fishing line. After Lang thought the man finally decided to let fate settle his mind, Summerlid called back to the clansman on the bank. There is a huge new salmon yonder, swimming and proudly leaping in that dark pool ahead. If I catch him, I will return to claim the sea to me forefathers for old. However, if I dinna, Summerlid will remain here, a wanderer of the wild wood. Now the gale are a race who live by the laws of omens, and so understood that fate should make the first move in answering. With a single cast Summerlid caught that leaping salmon, and so came ashore. He gathered his few things from Morvern Cave, which had so long been his lonely home, then set for ship, sea and sky. On broad bottom Berlins they rode the wide, rolling waves of the cold grey-green sea until the shores of sky were reached. There Summerlid was met by a great crowd of high-hearted clansmen. The young forest dweller rose to the challenges of chief with his characteristic calm and fox-like wisdom. One of the first encounters with enemies of his claim was against a great Norwegian fleet filled with mail-clad fighting men. Summerlid had only one hundred followers of his own, and knew well the fate of his father when facing greater numbers of Norsemen, so he devised a stratagem to even up the odds against him. The young lord had the invaders led to an island where he and his hundred warriors waited. Before the enemy fleet arrived, Summerlid and his weapon wielders killed enough cattle to cover each of the warriors with a hide. When the Norwegian fleet appeared before them in the bay, Summerlid had his men march round the high hill he had encamped on. As the column moved round that hill and out from the enemy's sight, he told each to don their cowhide, hair side up, and march round again. Each warrior did this in turn. On their last trip round, each flipped the hide o'er and marched in view a third and final time. The Norse warlords, sitting in their lang ships, counted three full divisions of well-armed warriors waiting to attack them. They had already sent a few ships into land before Summerlin made his march. Now the Norsemen were rethinking the amphibious attack. By this time, about sixty Danes had already landed and were securing the sandy shores of that island. Summerlid saw this and told his fearless fighters to follow him. He knew that with the rest of the fleet rethinking the attack, the few ashore would be faint-hearted about fighting and quick to turn back to the rest of their galleys. He called to his clansmen to show stout courage in combat and reap red ruin exactly as he would. Roaring out his war cry, Summerlid leaped from the hill and rushed like a storm of red ripping steel down on the beach Danes. As one his islanders followed fast for the free. Years of depredation fueled revenge that burned bright in their heaving hearts. They were a screaming temptus of deadly blue steels come to kill Danes. Summerlid, lord of steel and wielder of woe, ripped wildly delivering death to the first Dane to face him. 
With the edge of his shield he dashed out the Norseman's teeth, and with the might of a madman laid that Dane low. Then, in front of the enemy fleet and his own corpse-collecting clansmen, Summerled, dirk in hand, tore free the dead Dane's heart. He flung that Norseman's blood pump out toward the enemy fleet and went for another. Following orders, each of his clansmen who had killed flung their foe's heart at the floating fleet. So wildly did Summerlin's grim gift enthrall his reaping warriors that they all fought like fiends bathing red in the enemy's blood. As their chief predicted, the Danes fled the beach for their ships and fleet. Money a Dane drowned in his mail coat, and only one Norse ship made it away from that crimson shore. The rest had ne enough crew to carry them aft, and so fell fast under the islanders' fury. The Norse warlords, watching the ruin of that landing party, decided discretion was the wiser way this day, and turned helm for home. They sailed out of sight, all the while hearing the war song of Summerlid and its red-washed warriors. As their chief predicted, the Danes fled the beach for their ships and fleet. Mani a Dane drowned in his mail coat, and only one Norse ship made it away from that crimson shore. The rest had not enough crew to carry them aft, and so fell fast under the islander's fury. The Norse warlords, watching the ruin of that landing party, decided discretion was the wiser way this day, and turned helm for home. They sued out of sight, all the while hearing the war songs of Summerlid and his red-washed warriors. The islands of Mole and Morven were freed from the yoke of Norse slavery. The Lord of the Isles added two Norse warships to his fleet and returned to Skye, themed for his wisdom and wicked fighting fury. Summerlid, now loved for his victory, became the very valour of the Hebrides, and as such had little trouble gathering clansmen to his cause. He raised an army of islanders, and heeded by Berland for the lands of his ancestors. One by one he retook the lands of his forefathers from the Norse, then headed by fast fleet for the mainland. He landed in Argyll, and fought the sons of the Norse warriors who had with greater numbers defeated his father. This time the tables were turned and the island chief, a bulwark in battle, utterly destroyed the Danes of Argyll. By force of sword and shield he gained back the home of his great forefathers. Summerled took the title Thane of Argyll and set his ambitions towards the Isle of Man to create a Celtic kingdom. <laughs>